Not sure if you muted me. Hello, everyone, and welcome to ADV Moto Live number three. Today, we're going to talk about grassroots ADV racing. I hope everyone is doing well tonight while everyone is still locked down on COVID stuff. Tonight, we're going to cover, have you ever wanted to get into motorcycle racing, but you're not sure if you can, whether you're going for the gold or you're running for the fun, racing is a great way to challenge yourself, gain a lot of confidence in your riding, especially off-road riding, and be part of a really awesome community. We'll talk about this and a whole lot more tonight's episode of ADV Moto Live. All right, our first order of the day is going to be uh, a quick announcement, a shout out for the guys at BDR. Um, they are currently running a KTM 790 Adventure R sweepstakes. Uh, most of you may already know that BDR is a nonprofit organization, uh, and this is an important fundraising program for them this year. They do a lot of work around the United States to uh, create off-road trails that uh, all of us, on and off-road trails, all of us can use um, no matter where we are, east or west. This is not a normal 790, though. Uh, there's a ton of really cool upgrades to it, uh, including a bunch of shock and suspension upgrades that anyone would be interested in. And we have a note from Paul Gillian, who will tell us a little more about it. Okay. Hey, Paul with Backcountry Discovery Routes here. Just want to thank Carl and the team at ADV Moto Magazine for always looking out for the BDR and supporting us. Uh, we're here to talk about this bike. It's KTM 790 Adventure R. It was donated by KTM. And you can win it by going to winktm790.com and you can enter to win the sweepstakes. Um, it's a 790. It's fully outfitted with all kinds of goodies. Um, the cool thing about this is it's got a custom graphics package on it that was designed by Tim James at James Howard. Um, we've got upper crash bars, lower crash bars by Touratech. We also have the brand new rally form skid plate, which we're just about to install on this. It's a four millimeter skid plate with hydroformed sides that protect the lower part of the tank here where this bike is, is vulnerable. We've also got a quick release pannier system. This is the Zega Evo X. It's cut out around the exhaust. We also have a headlight guard up front. We've got these lights that were donated by Daryl at Cyclops, so some really nice LED lights. The thing that you really want this bike for, though, is the suspension system. This has got a WP Explore Pro suspension package on it. It's a $6,000 package. It includes premium rear shock and then completely new fork legs with internals that use cone valve technology. So this is the same type of stuff that the guys in the Dakar Rally are using, same sort of technology. So it's a huge upgrade for this bike. Um, and if that's not enough for you, I'm gonna break news right now and let you know that Turtex also donating the Aventuro Traveler. This is a carbon fiber flip face helmet, so it's lightweight, it's got a ton of airflow. So this is really designed for riding off-road and it's also made out of carbon this fiber, carbon so fiber. it's lightweight, really airy. All proceeds go to benefit the BDR, so go to winktm790.com and enter to win this bike. Well, all right, that was an awesome wrap-up of the bike. You can tell there's a ton of cool stuff on there. Um, it's, uh, I guess donations are starting at around $25, uh, and they include a chance to win uh, an awesome ride. I don't even know if you can find 790s in the dealers still. I know they were sold out for a while. So please visit winktm 790 dot com for more info but now move on to our second news bit um, what we've got is um one of the reasons for the racing show today is every may for those that don't know uh adv moto has been doing a racing rally edition um that pays attention to the international uh, and also some of the domestic racing that goes on in the dual sport world we love racing for all the reasons that it has a lot of the cross-cultural uh, components as well as the human, uh, physical, and mental challenges. So I just want to do a quick flick through the issue for those that haven't seen it. Uh, on the cover, we've got Ricky Brabeck. This is a little bit of news, too, for those that don't follow rally racing. Um, Ricky Brabeck brought home the first ever gold um, medal for the United States and, uh, and since the entire history of the Dakar Rally this year, and that's really exciting. 
And uh, congratulations to Ricky Brabeck and uh, also the guys at Honda for uh, pulling that off. It's really fantastic. Inside, we've got uh, a couple of things like product reviews. We got a Persang jacket, Phantom jacket from our friends at Moto Nation. That's an affordable line of stuff that they're coming out with. This is the feature story. Um, worth reading if you guys like it. Uh, tells about his experience at the car and everything it took to make it happen. We also got an article uh, just to blow through them on the Baja 1000. Uh, solo motorcycle adventures. Ways to have adventures uh, without having to go to the other side of the planet. Uh, some features on kids gear. And, uh, of course, a installment of the latest edition of Far Rider. So uh, if you guys haven't seen the print issue or the PDF version of the print issue, uh, definitely come check it out. But we have a lot of really awesome guests today. Um, our guests today have a ton of experience uh, racing and all kinds of, uh, I mean, around the world and in the U.S. Our first guest has uh, been working the racing scene in the U.S. for years now, and he heads the AMA Supermoto Series. Um, everyone, please welcome Alex Mock. Hey, Alex, let me uh, be sure to get you unmuted here. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing well. How are you guys? Uh, hope everyone's well and safe and healthy. Uh, these are unfortunate times for everyone, but I hope everyone's uh, riding it out. We're all in it together, so... Let's hang in there. We're almost there. I'm doing well. Yeah, yeah. for sure, man. And thanks for having me. No, it's it's cool. So, can you tell everyone, you know, sort of, hey, where you're at, and then, um, and then, how did you get to be the AMA Supermoto organizer? Well, uh, years ago, 2014, I was helping the previous promoter uh, doing some sponsor um, uh, relation and acquisitions, and it kind of led. Uh, into me taking it over in 2017 uh, when they could no longer continue to promote it. Uh, all the effort and time that we put into it, um, sponsor-wise, racers, spectators, fans, uh, venues, you know, everyone that it takes to run races um, came together and uh, wanted to make it happen. So um, I ran with it in 17 and here we are uh, in 2020 still going strong. Um, and not only am I running the AMA Supermoto National Championship Series, I also run the and race operations and timing and scoring for the AMA uh, National Championship uh, Super Hooligan Series. Well, it stands. Oh man, that's that's a lot of works. And uh, and I guess some, some folks don't know, but uh, Alex is also a recent father, so he's got a whole lot of work at home too oh, yeah. as well. <laughs> Yeah, with uh, with uh, two small kids, there's no doubt that's a real life changing experience. So you know what we want to kind of focus on here too is uh, you know is is racing. You know, a lot of times the media when you have uh, racing, you know, you see it's a lot of flash. Oh, yeah. You know, you got a lot of jumping and all kinds of stuff. But really, you know, let's say if you look at the total body of people that race motorcycles, um, mm -hmm. at least in the U.S. or in your experience, you know, right. how many of them are really actually, you know, going for the points hardcore? And, you know, how many of them do you think are just kind of doing it for fun? I would say it's 50-50, you know, on any given day, it's probably more or less, uh, depending on who shows up, uh, what venue it is, and obviously how much the purse is. Uh, there's a lot of variable factors that pull people out of the woodworks. You know, some people may not race a local race, uh, because that's just not worth it for them. Uh, the risk is too high. You know, maybe the injury, uh, you know, risk to getting injured at a local race and they can't go chase a national championship. So sometimes you'll see uh, racers that show up at certain races that normally don't show up just because um, either they're in the area or just trying to get some seat time before a race. Uh, so they might, you know, pop out at a local track and you know, put in some work just to get acclimated to the weather and you know, everything about it. Uh, time change, I think, is the most important for international riders and ones that travel. All right, on, man. So, you know, I mean, I mean, in the years that you've had, uh, you know, AMA Supermoto, you know, sort of, sort of under your belt, I mean, I've seen a growth. I mean, there's been a growth uh, from what I understand in riders, uh, you know, but also in sponsorships. You know, I mean, um, uh, I know that we had talked a, a, a little while ago, maybe about a year ago, you know, talking about how, um, you know, flat track had an impact on the supermoto scene. Um, you know, Absolutely. And I mean, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, 
could you comment a little bit on that and in, yeah. in terms of the impact and, and is that still there today or? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, uh, you know, it's all hand in hand, you know, if it's moto, ADV, you know, adventure riding, road racing, flat track, super moto, trials, um, speedway, you name it, um, you know, hill climb, ice racing, you name it, it's, it's all hand in hand. I mean, uh, to tell you the truth, I mean, I actually recommend all riders go you know, get on a lower CC flat track bike and go spin some flat track laps. Uh, it's one of the, the basics that will teach you a lot in body positioning, throttle, throttle control, um, and just everything in general, you know, without the, without the whoops and the jumps and the big burns and, you know, everyone else around that's intimidating, you know, a motorcycle is intimidating enough. And then you add a jump or an obstacle or, you know, and let alone people that are more advanced than you, uh, it, it's, it's one of those things that you got to overcome in your head. Um, to me, it's just go out there and try it, you know, uh, take every opportunity to ride a bike. Um, doesn't matter what discipline it is. Um, every style of riding is different. And, you know, some of the techniques are cross trained over to the other, um, other disciplines. You, you take a look at like Valentino Rossi and all the road race guys. They're out there religiously riding flat track. All of the supermoto guys, uh, they they are very proficient at flat track and their skills. Uh, you look at every single one of them, and you know they're they're not scared to let that rear wheel kick out and you know do something different. So yeah, get out yeah, of that traction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, now, now, uh, now this is the other thing too. Um, it might seem a little bit basic, but it probably doesn't hurt. Uh, you know, could, could you let everyone know, like, what is supermoto, you know, cause if you see supermoto bikes on the street, uh, you know, or you, or you, or, or you, you know, see them in, in photos or on, you know, social media or something like that, it's like, right. what is that dirt bike got street wheels? So, you know, w what is the challenge and, and, and the allure, you know, like a supermoto, um, because it is a cross terrain kind of race too. Well, you know, I mean, just look at them, you know, Google it, type in supermoto, look at them. Mm -hmm. They look awesome, yeah. you know, every single one of them looks amazing. Um, and essentially, it's just a dirt bike platform with road race slick tires. Um, and it's just... How, a, does, how, how does that change the experience? Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of it's mental. You know, a lot of the guys will go in there and think they have no traction because it's a slick, uh, especially in the dirt sections. You know, uh, traditional super, supermoto, we're running anywhere from 50, 60, 70% asphalt, you know, 30, 40, 50% dirt. Um, and it's just one of those things, you know, how do you set your bike up? Do you set it up for jumps? Do you set it up for the pavement asphalt? Do you set it up for the dirt? You know, a lot of the racers will set it up for two of the three and uh, just be proficient enough with their skills to handle the third. Uh, so it's, it's very exciting to watch. It's one of those sports that, you know, you can literally be right up to the fence and, you know, these guys are going 80 miles per hour down the straight and then banging the gears down, backing it in and sliding, you know, and that's literally all, you know, five, 10 feet away from you. Uh, it's very exciting. It's one of those sports that uh, I wish it, it gained a little more traction uh, in the past to keep it going. But, you know, that's what we're here for. That's what the sponsors are, are doing. They're, they see it, they see the growth, they see it everywhere. Uh, I think it's just one of those times where it's uh, it's time to add some supermoto back into uh, mainstream television. Yeah, yeah, that would be that that would be awesome. So, you know, how long has supermoto been a form of racing in in the U.S.? Oh, it's been around uh, since the early '80s as the super bikers. Uh, if you guys Google um, super bikers, you'll see um, they were. They were on flat track bikes. You know, a lot of them were running dirt track tires, flat track setups. And, you know, the, the, you talk to some of the guys that raced back then to uh, some of the guys that are riding now, um, the equipment has significantly changed. Um, they literally make mm. uh, oversized front brakes, slipper clutches um, for Supermoto now. Uh, before it was just kind of putting it all together and making it work. Uh, but I think uh, the years of development and research, they, they kind of, um, you know, made it happen. So now there's aftermarket parts that you can buy. You can literally uh, buy a motorcycle from the dealership, 
buy some aftermarket parts, some wheels, oversized front brakes, and a slipper clutch, and maybe and get some suspension, and slap it all in, and there you go. You know, you you got a su super moto bike. So it's not like you have to yes. do any engine work or framework or anything like that. You know, the average Joe can you know read the pick up the manual. Uh, you know, kind of read how to replace the parts and go ahead and do it themselves, make a project out of it. So bare bones, like if someone just straight up wanted to go on, go on, you know, online and to, to where, wherever they, you know, get some used, you know, you know, secondhand bikes, bare bones. Right. How much are you looking at? If you really wanted to go bare bones, I would say two grand. You know, if you already have two a motorcycle. Grand two grand and you got a decent setup and it, and you know obviously you can it, that varies you know do you buy used or do you buy new right well so you buy used to use you know? i'll tell you what uh, when we got into supermoto i didn't even really start buying new parts until recently because i have a race team now i gotta have you know brand new parts for for the riders you know i can't be using you know old parts just in case of failures but you know when we first got into it and a lot of people still to this day the initial everyone knows the initial buy is what gets you you know after after you buy the the parts you know that the value drops down so you know go go craigslist it you know go on craigslist search a supermoto find a bike that you like and you could probably pick up a whole a full bike ready to race hit the track you know for three four five grand you know get a really nice oh. one for six grand you know, Husqvarna makes, you know, FS 450s these days. Actually, there's three of them back here. I mean, they're beautiful bikes. Um, Honda makes the the CRF R uh, 450R, and and this was actually a bike that I went to all my sponsors and and we made edits of all the builds on how to you know swap a motocross bike into supermoto and get it ready to hit the track. Awesome, awesome. Now, out of all the racing in the U.S., I mean, now not not talking about motorcycle, uh, supermoto, but right. just motorcycle racing in the U.S. in general. You know, I mean, sure. I mean, what are some things that you would like to see improve in it? Um, actually, tell you the truth, motor race, motorcycle racing in the U.S. to me is is growing. Uh, other people will probably say otherwise, but even you know, I work in supermoto and and do a little super hooligan stuff, and that's a small niche compared to road racing and and uh, motocross and some of the other stuff, uh, adventure motorcycle riding, you know, that stuff is worldly renowned and it gets gets a lot of publicity. But, you know, um, I think racing in general is on a boom. You know, look at, look at right now, everyone's on a hiatus. I think you talk to anyone that rides uh, or races or just get, gets out on the weekend, they're itching to get out there, um, you know? So to me, I think it's, it's booming. Um, what I'd like to see change is, uh, you know, just have more people show up, you know, more newcomers show up, more fans to, to the races, you know, and, and I do a lot of stuff with, um, you know, other, you know, other disciplines, you know, of, you know, car racing and, and that type of stuff. And, and we cross it over because we're, we're all, we're all motorheads, you know, we're, we're all yeah. wheel fanatics. Yeah. We just, we just like that adrenaline. So, you know, it's, it's crazy that, you know, you, you hang out with certain people and then you can just bring them into, you know, a whole new world and vice versa. And to me, that's what needs to happen is, you know, if you're a rider or a racer or you're, you know, the weekend guy that hits the track, invite your fa family and friends out there, invite your neighbor, invite your friend, um, you know, see if they like it. And, and to me, that'll grow the sport, that'll grow everything. And, you know, it's more people will get involved. Um, I, I strongly recommend everyone if they have kids to look into the Strider bikes, you know, or something similar, uh, the Stasis, oh, yeah, Strider you know, the Stasics are a great one if they're, they're a little older and they're uh, ready for some type of, you know, throttle type, type bike. Um, it's great. You know, take a look at those. They're stepping stones and, you know, I, I support it. I support what my kids do. You know, I'm, I'm big in motorcycles. If, if my daughters don't want to do motorcycles, then, then hey, you know, we're not doing motorcycles for them. But you know, it's one of those things. Um, they, I don't think anybody will know until you try it, right? So um, just go out there, give it a shot, and 
Well, write them in, and that's probably the most important thing. You know, it doesn't matter if you're starting a starting a starting a vlog or a webcast, or you're going to set off around the world, or you want to start racing supermoto or m motocross or rally racing. The number one thing you can do is just get your butt in gear and go out there and do it. And it doesn't really matter if you have crappy equipment or or whatever. I mean, you want that to be as best as you can, but the main thing is to just kind of you know get out there and and just just get your feet feet wet, you know. I'll tell you why. I mean, you, people go out there and register and, you know, grab, grab a couple of your friends that you ride with, grab a couple of friends that you've talked about and just say, hey, let's go register. Let's go show up, go through the process, see, see if you like it. And if it's something yeah. that you're, you're, you don't like or you're intimidated, uh, you don't have to race. I mean, there's, there's practices before that. You can go practice, kind of see where you're at. A lot of, a lot of uh, race organizers have timing and scoring so they could kind of let you know where they're at, where you're at uh, time-wise, um, uh, skill level compared to everyone else. And a lot of the times they'll bump the faster people up or down um, so to keep yeah. it safe for everybody. Um, and it's just one of those things, go out there, give it a shot. And I guarantee you, you're gonna have an ear to ear smile, you know, and hopefully you don't crash, but if you do, you know, get right back up and try it again. That's, uh, right on, man. Well, awesome. Tell you what, uh, I, I would like you to, to stick around for our next guest here, um, signing in from Lithuania um, at uh, at 3 a.m. Uh, our next guest likely needs no introduction. Um, her uh, her her writing is absolutely prolific uh, in the ADV community, um, and uh, has braced not only adventure travel uh, but also uh, international rally racing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please, if we could welcome Egala in. Egala, Egala Gerule Tita. I have been, I have been trying to do that for a long time. Let's see if she is in here. Oh, there she is. How's it going, Egala? Good. How are you? Oh, good. Good. Thanks for coming in. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's so late over there. It's, I guess, I guess now it's a little after three, right? Yeah, I'm looking at it. It's early, you know, so it's all good. Thank you for having me here. It's really cool to be here. No, it's totally cool. You know, thanks for making the effort. So, you know, there are very few people uh, in, in the world. I mean, actually, uh, I think uh, I think in three days, uh, I celebrate 10 years of publishing ADV Moto. So that's how kind of long it's been wow, in those 10 awesome. years. Yeah, there, there has been there has been very few of the travelers of of the kind of like adventure world travelers that have gone into international rally racing you know um and uh and and for me i'm a person um you know like we just spoke to with alex that you know i really want to go out and try a race myself like a hair scramble or something just on a casual basis you know I, i'm not expecting to really you know bring back a trophy or you know collect all my points at the end of the season or whatever but you know i just kind of want to be out there with people and stuff like that, but you actually took that, took that leap. So can you kind of tell us about, about, you know, what impelled you to go from adventure travel to adventure racing? Um, well, it was, um, it was chasing Rally Dakar in, uh, 2019. I just kind of happened to be in Peru. I was traveling across South America on my bike. And, uh, I realized that Rally Dakar was going to be held in just one country in South America that year. And that was Peru. And so I thought um, I would chase it. But at that point, I wasn't really that much into racing. I wasn't really that interested, to be honest. And it just it mm. was just luck. Like, okay, Dakar is going to go through um, all of these areas that I kind of already know. So it's all good. I'm just going to give it a go. But then, and I thought I would chase it for a day or two, like see what, you know, what it was all about and and then probably leave and, and ride to Chile or whatever. But then the minute I got to the bivouac in Lima, I was just like, oh my God, I am not going to miss a minute of this. This is beyond awesome. I was just like instantly hooked. I was just so fascinated. And uh, and so I ended up chasing the whole rally. And it was like, I don't know, it was just an absolutely unforgettable experience for me. And then I think it was Nathan actually who said, look, if you're so fascinated with the whole thing, well, why don't you try racing yourself? And at the time I thought the thought was absolutely ridiculous because I only started riding off with maybe three years ago. And like, huh. you know, just, just three years ago, just doing the Trans America Trail for me was kind of a big deal. Um, so mm -hmm. like, I'm, and now I'm going to go from that to rally racing? Like, you know, that, that just didn't sound possible at all. But then I realized you don't go from zero to Dakar. 
there's a whole bunch of mm. events in between. And then I got an invitation to race at the Hellas Rally Raid in Greece, which is a seven day road with navigation rally. And I just said, yes, like I didn't even think about it. I packed up my bike, sent it to Europe <laughs> and rode to Greece and, and raised Hellas for the first time. And, and that's kind of the amazing part with these bigger European rallies is that they're super amateur friendly. You don't need an FIM license. You don't need to be, you know, like a, a licensed racer, any of those things, you can just go and, and give it a go. And like, that's really awesome because it's so inclusive and it's just manageable and doable. Even for somebody who, you know, just a couple of years back thought that doing the Transamerica trail was like, you know, a really huge deal. Yeah. So what bike, you know, were you on, you know, like a lot of the uh, international rally racers, I mean, they got like, they got some like crazy, you know, crazy expensive, cool bikes that are, you know, super set up with multiple gas tanks and kind of stuff like that. So, you know, what was your kit? Yeah, no, I totally want uh, a super cool rally bike at some point for sure. But um, since it was my first rally and I had no idea how that was going to go, like no clue at all. I, I didn't feel like investing a ton of money um, into my bike or any new upgrades or anything like that. I had uh, a DR650 at the time, still have the same bike. I uh, still plan to race nice. on that same bike this year, hopefully. Um, and it was actually pretty great. I mean, yeah, it's not a rally motorcycle. It was a bit too big, a bit too heavy, I guess. But, um, you know, in Hellas, you have a bunch of different classes. So you can really race on anything from 250cc to 1200cc. Like, it's totally up to you. All of these amateur classes, you can race on anything at all. And so that wasn't, that wasn't really a problem. And I was actually quite happy because I'm not great with, like, the mechanical side of things. So the fact that the DR did not break, like, at all, was really good because I could just trust the bike. Um, so that was actually pretty awesome. Cool. Of course, I wasn't very fast. Like as a sporting result, it was absolutely miserable. It was pathetic. But as an experience, I really learned a ton and I really learned like what I need to improve if I, if I want to do better and stuff like that. So as an experience and like a learning curve, that was just absolutely, absolutely fantastic. And, and that's kind of like, you know, if anybody wants to do that, um, yeah, you start thinking about bikes and upgrades and all, all, all kinds of things. But if it's your first rally, like just go with whatever you have, because if you, you know, if you, if you then, if you get hooked, if you love it, then you can start thinking about upgrades, new bikes, whatever. But just for the first one, just to give it a go, I think anything is fine. Well, that's cool. So are there, are there any races, you know, like in, in, in the U S you know, or in like Mexico that you would do, or maybe some supermoto wink, wink. <laughs> I would, I would, I would love to see you do some supermoto. I think that would be amazing. The bike's already That's half awesome. there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, yeah. everyone's riding the DRZs out here in SoCal too. That's the, that's the big popular street bike out here. Oh, okay. Well, so, yeah. yeah. Um, we have, we have yeah. plenty of bikes. If you ever hit it to SoCal, you know, definitely get in touch with Carl. We'll have Carl come out and you know document it, and we'll all go and you know spin some laps nice that sounds really good um yeah, yeah really cool. um uh, mexico's got some really cool rallies like coast to coast um sonora is the, yeah. one of the bigger ones i think right um and there's i think there's a few smaller ones and then you've got baja 1000 obviously so yeah at some point that that would be great yeah that would be super cool i think i'd love to see it so so you did hell us and then you did the Hispania, right? Yeah, so Hispania was this year before the whole COVID-19 thing kicked off. Um, and uh, that was a, a smaller race, so it was only, well, uh, it was five days. And uh, I guess it was a little easier than Hellas, but it was still pretty challenging for me at least. And, you know, the scenery was amazing. And, and um, the people the people are always amazing at a rally. Like, everybody's competing out there on the trails. But back at the bivouac, everyone's like this huge, big family, and everybody's kind of rooting for each other which is really cool. Yeah. Um, and then I was going to do Hellas again, but unfortunately, of course, that got postponed. So that's not going to, that's not going to have it anytime soon. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the, the whole thing about rally racing is it's, it's a challenge for yourself. Like you might not do well in like the overall result or whatever, but that's fine. Like for me, it, it was a huge step up from just, just off road riding, just kind of plodding along, you know, to this. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, who knows, who knows where it's going to take me. And I, I'm just, I'm just really appreciative of the fact that these European rallies are so open to amateurs. Um, you know, some yeah, classes cool. like don't even get disqualified. If, for example, if you don't finish a special stage, you can still start the next day. So it's really like, 
very, very sort of inclusive atmosphere, I guess. And that really helps. That's cool. It, yeah, I guess they figure, you know, like if anyone's got the gumption to, to, you know, to fly to a different country and bring your bike out there, um, you know, there's a lot of people, you, you just need to let them have fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and just finish, you know, I think just finishing would be a dream for a lot of people that are kind of marginal, you know, they're just kind of like, well, you know, I can ride off road and, you know, maybe I have been doing some light local regional racing or something, but, you know, going, going overseas and, you know, doing it in Morocco or something like that is just kind of, you know, I think people feel like it's sort of unobtainium and I've, and I'm sure there's cost to it. Um, you know, but it's not impossible. I mean, that's what adventure is about really, right. Setting a goal and then making it happen you know so so from your first race you know uh, what do you think is the most important thing you learned from from your first race which i guess would be the hellas rally um oh a whole a whole lot really um you know when it came to my riding obviously i need to i need to be faster so i really needed to get some more training it wasn't enough you know um so so that was that but then also it's all about endurance and it's all about kind of like the long game right it's it doesn't matter if you're good one day or two days you gotta be you gotta stick it out for seven days so it's, so it's like a marathon type of thing right it's not a sprint um and then road with navigation was really interesting for me because again i've never done that before like i had I had no clue and then um that whole thing was pretty interesting and it's it, it, i was actually fascinated because it's actually easier to navigate with a road book in a rally than with a gps because you can kind of plan ahead a little bit and you can see what's coming and stuff like that um so that was pretty cool um and then yeah just pacing yourself and kind of managing the fatigue and exhaustion which kind of starts to set in by day four day five i was kind of struggling towards the end to be honest um so just these kind of things and then um logistics wise like i did not have any support um and it was fine because of my dr650 it's indestructible i mean i tried to destroy it multiple times you know it just it, yeah. it just keeps on going so that was great but if you have a bike that's maybe a little um you know a little more delicate or whatever then, then having support would be good so just things like that but you know um the organizer of hellas um Letis Tamatis, um he always says the best practice for a rally is a rally and he's just absolutely right there's so many like training events and all kinds of things that you can do but if you want to know what a rally is about you got to do a rally there's no way around it yeah right on hey alex would you do a rally absolutely i would hell yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. i probably some, wouldn't do like a peeps. i wouldn't do like a seven seven day or anything like that but i would i'd i'd give like a three four five day a shot you know yeah, Why yeah. Not? All right, and so I think there are it. some. I'll go to California Komodo, and you come over here. You can have my bike and go race a rally. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm just cruising. <laughs> that would be fun, awesome. Yeah. I'm a cruise rider. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> not trying. Yeah, to... you know what? But you, yeah, you know what? Like at I think it was like three or four years ago, we went to the Sandblast Rally, which is over here on on the East Coast, and it's a small, very you know, kind of fun intimate rally based out of a small town and on these sandy trails in this park and they take the whole park over and there was this husband and wife couple that they were there and they uh, and someone stole the wife's bike out of the town oh. and i think the police knew exactly who it was but they didn't get it back in time so the husband loaned his bike to the wife and she watched and uh i can remember because i was there photographing it you know she was always last and she was just putting down the <laughs> putting down the road, basically like like traveling speed. And everyone's just cheering and waiting. You know, you know, and she's giving the queen's wave as she goes by and stuff like that. You know, and it's just pure fun. That you she got I mean? the most photos had, too. Yeah, she probably <laughs> had the most photos. She probably got the most photos too. But it was just pure fun. You know, she wasn't she wasn't being overly aggressive. Okay. She was just straight up, just out there having fun, trying to keep it up in the sandy ruts and. You know, like all that kinds of stuff. And I remembered that. I was just like, dude, you know, she doesn't care at all. You know what I mean? She's just she, she's just out there for herself and she's having a great experience and she's learning and she's got all the support from these people who don't care if you're the world's fastest racer. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, they just appreciate you because you're out there. And I think that's right. a really wonderful thing about racing. You know, I you know couldn't I mean? even it's imagine a, racing Dakar. Um, I try to break it down like this, right? Flat track, you're just racing in an oval, right? It's just... You know, the track changes, it's wet, dry, dusty, right? It changes every lap, but it's still the same formation. Supermoto, you have asphalt that never changes, and then you have the dirt that will somewhat change. Uh, road race, asphalt never changes. Motocross, every lap changes. And, but then like the car, 
you don't even see the first lap. It's like, you're just se sending it straight. You know, you're doing, you're just going for it. It's just like, you, you, don't, you don't even know where the turn's coming and you don't know if there's a boulder there or what. So yeah, I give it up to everyone that does that. That's, that's wide open. Guts. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's amazing. I mean, you know, seeing the footage of, of people doing international rally racing for multiple days, doing 80, 90, or one hundred twenty miles an hour over sand and rocks and roots and on, you know, like down riverbeds and stuff. It's some otherworldly stuff to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like as a rider, like that level of skill to me is just it's just like some some wild stuff. Now, um, now uh, he, here's a question. You know, perhaps uh, that will be good for both of you, but, you know, how do you think the presence of women in racing today is compared to, say, five or ten years ago, um, you know, and, like, respectively, where would you guys like to see it go? Alex, you want to feel that one uh, first? Yeah, uh, tell you the truth, we see lots of women racing, uh, believe it or not, racing, you know, not just out there riding and practicing, they actually race. Um, I see it in the Supermoto, um, and I see it in motocross, I see it in flat track, and believe it or not, super hooligans. I mean, these these ladies are, you know, taking 650 pound plus bikes and sending it, you know, it's, it's pretty, no, I'm sorry, 450 pound plus, you know, 650 cc, CC plus yeah. bikes <laughs> sending, yeah. Actually, no, seven, 750 cc, it's not even 650. Super Hooligans is 750. Yeah. So 750 and up, yeah. 400 pound minimum. I mean, that's uh, that's probably like a Dakar bike, right? Just less, more horsepower. I think the cars are, uh, well, they're 450 limited by displacement, but I think most of them weigh in with gas and everything, like about three 350 pounds. Is that right, Egola, somewhere around there? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I'm yeah, sure. but yeah. Women, women racing, we see it all over. Um, I, I always, in all my local series, I always have a women's only class um, to kind of just let them not have the fear of, you know, having to deal with the boys. Um, but tell you the truth, every time I have a women's only class, they never sign up for women's only and they race with the boys. So right on. That's cool. Hands yeah. down, yeah. Cool. you know, some of those, some of those girls send it and, and beat the boys. So to the cool. ladies. And then I think Aglae? when it comes to, to Rally Dakar, obviously Laya Sanz has been the superstar for years and years now, but um, there's a lot of new faces. Like this year, I know for some of the women, um, the, the, you know, ISO's move to Saudi Arabia was maybe a bit of a kind of a tough situation, but then at the same time, you had like two South African women racing the Dakar for the first time ever. So, you know, I think that's, yeah, it's definitely happening. And also, like, on the, again, back to the sort of amateur level, back at Hellas or Hispania, um, I mean, yeah, there's definitely more and more women at the bivouac. And, and this year at Hispania, I met uh, this woman from Israel who was a 54-year-old midwife. You know, so, like, <laughs> yeah, there's definitely wow, that's awesome. um, a lot a lot more interest. And I think, you know, the atmosphere of the bivouac is, is, is really again, super inclusive and friendly, and it's not, you know, it's not like the Vans world, whatever crap anymore. It's just, I think a lot of people are just accepting it a lot more, and, and it's, yeah, it's, I, th I think it's going good. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, I mean, like, would you like to see it grow more in the future? Of course, you know, I mean, or, or, or would there be special programs that you would like to see that would actually, you know, like, specifically focus on growing women, let's say, in rally racing? Or do you think it's not needed? I think it's um, needed. Sorry, Alex, uh, go, ahead. go ahead. Sorry, I was just chiming in, just saying, I think it's needed, you know, just, you know, women uh, getting into and uh, all, all types of racing. And, you know, it's, it's very important. Yeah, yeah. And Agile? Are there any special programs um, that you would know. like to see, or do you think it's not important? Or perhaps, but um, I think women do kind of have this thing sometimes where we maybe feel not confident enough to ride with the guys because typically, you know, uh, they're either faster or better, or whatever. Um, at least in the beginning, I don't know. But like, there is that confidence gap, not necessarily a skill gap, but definitely confidence gap. Confidence um, gap. So yeah. 
Sure. Yeah, so I'm not sure about like training programs, but just maybe more awareness or just uh, be more inclusive, that kind of thing. Maybe maybe that would be enough. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Now, now are there uh, so now when 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 they have the rally races, um, you know, how are the categories you know like uh, divided up? There's no men's and women's category in the rally races, right? Or is it just by your kind of like your experience level? So, yeah, so you have um, all the categories according to, to bike size, um, and then uh, they do oh. have a women's class every time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, right on. That's cool. That's cool. So, uh, also a similar question um, to Agle. I'm still, after, after, after all these years, I'm still trying to get your name right. Um, how <laughs> much of the racing and competitive world, um, you know, do, do you think competes simply for the sake of competition? Uh, or is it just mostly for fun? Um, I think it's both. Uh, I think it's I think it's both because there's joy in both. I guess you know, like even for me, um, at Hispani, I came in 112, I think something like that, which is again absolutely ridiculous, you know, as a sporting result. But that was a better result than Halos. And so for me, it's like, oh, okay, well, can I pass somebody else? Can I, can I do a little bit? Like, it's just, you know, just for me. And, and of course, you know, I have no illusions of ever coming in the top five or top 10 or anything like that. But if I can go from 112 to 102nd, like, oh, okay, cool. So it's kind of, yeah, you know, yeah, cool. it's both. Uh, I mean, and for me, I mostly just compete with myself. If I can do better than I did last year, that, that's, that's fantastic. But, right. but yeah, I think that, that there's fun in both and just doing it, um, just enjoying like the rides, the tracks, the scenery or whatever um but also being a bit com competitive i think that's th that can be quite healthy and fun too yeah yeah that's true now how much would you say your off-road riding skills have grown because of it a lot definitely a lot because i think you know when you're just riding along and i travel alone so that's also a factor so i wouldn't go on like gnarly single track on my own probably and even if i do then i'll be riding pretty conservatively because again i'm alone and i don't don't even carry the you know the satellite garmin in which whatever thingy which i probably should but um but so so when i'm alone and just traveling i'll just be a lot more cautious i guess whereas in a rally setting you can really go for it you can just, you know, oh, like right really, really push yourself and challenge yourself because, you know, there's like an entire like medical staff on standby, like there, people will come get you, you know, if something happens. So, so that kind of helps and you can really just push yourself to, you know, however far you want to go. So, yeah. It wow, that's cool. That, yeah, that's awesome. And I think there's probably more than a few of us riders that say that we came from a street or travel background, uh, you know, that could appreciate having that kind of setup you know, for us to kind of like allow ourselves to open up, whether it's on a track, you know what I mean? Or, you know, or, or it's on the course, you know, but the point is, is you have a support crew there, like in case something goes wrong, there's rules, there's safety, you know, everyone's running in the same direction. You're not, you know, you're not running into oncoming traffic, you know, and all these other kinds of things. And it, and it just really allows you that, that, that kind of stable environment, you know, where you can actually push, push your limits and improve yourself as a rider. Um, you know, and I think that's, that's a, that, that's a real merit to racing. Well, all right, let's go ahead and move on to, uh, to the next, um, to our next guest, uh, Alex, uh, we're going to sign off here though. Thanks very Hi. much, man, for hey. coming on. Uh, Thank you guys. You know, Thank and you we will be me. in touch soon. No, it's very cool, man. And, uh, have a good night over there and good luck with the little ones. Thank you. See you guys. All right. right stay on. safe. Stay right, healthy. <laughs> all right. Thanks. All right. Let me see here. So I'm going to manage this. All right. All right. Now, uh, our next guest, um, speaking of racing just for fun, uh, our next guest hails from Utah. Um, he is, uh, he is uh, involved in a myriad of outdoor activities. Um, but most notably, he finished the Dakar uh, 2019 as a rookie, and he's featured on our May 29 cover. Please welcome Nathan Rafferty. Nathan, how are you doing today? Good man. How are you, Carl? Oh, good man. Just staying alive over here. Uh, can Can you tell everyone where you're at? Uh, I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah. Just finished up uh, a day at work and still here at the office because we got great Wi-Fi. And uh, uh -oh. we'll be headed home after this up to Park City, Utah, where there's still a bunch of snow on the ground. But um, yeah, it's a nice time of year here in Utah. Right on. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, uh, you know, with, without further ado you know um based on the you know on, on on the story that we've done you also started 
you know, to a certain extent, just kind of, you know, doing uh, local riding. I think your first bike was the F650. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I guess I did everything kind of backwards. Uh, you know, I, I didn't own a motorcycle till I was 30 years old or so. And, um, you know, started on a dual sport bike and, uh, you know, rode that around Utah. And it was really the ultimate exploration tool, which I love. But I, you know, I ended up getting... As you get comfortable on that, you want to explore a little bit further. And I found out quickly that the smaller, lighter dirt bikes were better for that. So I uh, bought a KTM 450 and uh, got into a little bit of homegrown racing, hair scrambles here, a little enduro. And, you know, one thing leads to another. And, um, you know, finished a car last year with Egla 2019 when uh, she was down there for that. Yeah, that's right. You guys met there, right? So... What was the world like when you guys were there together, you know, because I think it was just kind of like random, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, you, she was there covering it. And I believe I mentioned to her that you were going to be there and just to kind of touch base. But, you know, I mean, our, you know, what I mean, that's, that's got to be a world away from our usual lives. Yeah, it, it was awesome. You know, she's super easy to get along with and, uh, she would bring me little snacks, little chocolate, uh, at the end of the day to, chocolate. uh, you know, <laughs> helped me through another couple thousand miles in the sand dunes. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was nice to have, have her around and just chit chat. And like she's been saying earlier, you know, the, it's a, it's a big race. I mean, it's the biggest motorcycle race in the world, but the, um, you know, every rally race I've done, the atmosphere in the bivouac is the same. Everybody wants to see their friends and family finish the race. And, uh, it's a rally is just a kind of a special sport, I think. Yeah, right on. So, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, when you were thinking about doing the rally racing, I mean, was there like a moment that like, you know, clicked for you and it became obvious, you know, I mean, sometimes it's like, you know, we have moments in life where we hit a fork on the road and then it's just kind of like, well, I'm going this way. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, was there a moment where you were just kind of sitting and like reflecting or you think, or m maybe you felt you weren't challenging yourself in your life or something or, or... No, I wouldn't go that deep. Uh, but I'd say, you know, I was, uh, I, I had gone on a trip to Morocco to ride off road for my 40th birthday. And, um, I went with my brother and a couple good buddies and a couple of the guys that were leading the tour, one of them was leaving after our tour to go put together the Merzuga rally also in Morocco. And uh, I started asking him questions about that. And is that something I could do? And you look into it and um, uh, it's one of the, you know, it's a classic desert Moroccan rally about, you know, five days. And uh, it was a nice stepping stone from kind of desert racing in the Western U S uh, to come out and do, uh, an event in Africa and a little bit easier in the fact that it was the kind of clover leaf. So you, you know, you were always basing out a hotel, um, and, uh, was, you know, you weren't moving bivouacs, you weren't sleeping on the dirt and rocks and, uh, you know, easier from that perspective, but still really, really tough for me. And, uh, you know, barely finished that race, but I did. And, you know, it's one of those things that you finish the race and I tell my wife, well, I'm glad I did that, but I never have to do that again. One of the toughest things I've ever done in the world. And then, you know, two weeks later, you start getting online and looking at other rallies and, you know, you guys all know how it goes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Then it's just like a bug, right? Like you're bit with it. No, totally. No, you totally kind of been after the Dakar and then sign up for the Silkway rally. Sorry, say that again. Uh, isn't that what you said after the Dakar, that it was just pure hell, and then you signed up for the Silkway Rally? I say it after every rally. I say it after every race. <laughs> I say, oh, I'm never going to do that again. And then it only takes a couple weeks. But, uh, yeah, hoping to go do uh, more of these. I, you know, I, I like to – the very – my goal is to not repeat a rally necessarily. I might repeat a couple of the rallies in Mexico, especially the Sonora Rally. It's so well run and uh, such a treat, and it's really close to home. So, But the big international rallies are, you know, a, a, a big commitment. And uh, But after hearing Egley talk about, 
Hispania. I'd like to go do that. And I had planned to do Silk Way this, um, this summer, which was Russia, Kazakhstan, Finnish and China that obviously went yeah. up in smoke. And, uh, um, but you know, we'll just put it on the calendar for another year. I'm going to hopefully in the next couple of weeks, if things open up, maybe early June, go do the, um, uh, Trans Am trail with my son. Igley did that. If she can finish that, I'm going to give it my best shot and uh, see if I can do it too. <laughs> right on, right on, right on. So, and this is, this is a question that'd be good for, I think both of you, but has, racing changed you guys as individuals uh and or impacted other aspects of your life as well you know what i mean um you know like not 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 even necessarily you know motorcycling but in terms of like you know has it made you more confident person um you know what yeah um for me absolutely 100 percent. you know i mean the dakar was and i've said it lots of times my you know my everest and it was something that 10 years ago, I would never even have contemplated uh, signing up for an event like that, let alone think about finishing it, let alone finishing in the top third. And uh, one of my friends, uh, guy I know, had climbed Everest, and he said, somebody told him, when you, when you complete something like that, it'll affect every decision that you make in your life moving forward, and you just have a different level of confidence and, you know, what the the things you decide to bite off or the things that you think you might be able to do, um, but you're not sure, you know, you just look at it with a totally different perspective. And, um, I, you know, I, I'd be interested to hear Egla's take on that as well. She, you know, she went from following the Dakar to having several big international rallies under her belt now. So she's on the way. <laughs> yeah. What yeah, like, happened, you know, you like know, do you have plans to run Dakar? Like, yeah. is this a big build up towards a, towards a big Dakar finish? Possibly. I mean, possibly. I guess, you know, confidence is definitely a big thing. Um, and, you know, what Nathan mentioned, but also just perspective, I guess, because nothing happens from zero to something awesome like this, right? This whole instant gratification thing, it just doesn't really work. Like, if you take a rally, you can't just look at the whole, like you have to take it by bite by bite, like bit by bit, day by day, right? If you look at the whole thing and you you might just think, oh my God, that's impossible or it's too much, whatever. But if you just look at look at it, okay, day one, you know, this, this, then day two, and, and you just do it like that, then then you definitely, um, then you can, you, you can, you can finish rally, you can do it. And so if you, if you look at the Dakar and go like, okay, well, I'm here and the Dakar is over there, no chance then yeah, that's probably going to be the case. But if you look at it, okay, I'm here, the Dakar is over there. What do I need to do to get there? And then start looking at it that way, you, you know, it's probably doable. So perspective is kind of a huge thing, I guess. Right on. So so it's kind of changed your perspective, uh, you know, about, about the things that you could accomplish, you know, and also breaking things down into sort of smaller bits. You know, it's like when you're bicycling up a hill and it's just this massive hill. <laughs> and normally what I do find is I find myself kind of looking down at the ground. Do you guys ever do that? You know what I mean? You know, like, you know, like I don't like, focus you know, on the massiveness of the hill. I, I just kind of more focus on what I have to do right now, you know, and, yeah. and then eventually I'll get up the hill. You know, I, I get into it even, um, I think about it even daily workouts when I go to the gym um, and I think, oh my gosh, this workout's going to kill me. And it, it's only... 25 minutes, 30 minutes long or whatever it is. But, you know, you look at that and you compare it to a 5,000 mile long race that is 10 or 12 stages. And you just think, let's get past, let's get halfway to the rest day. Let's get to the rest day. Let's, you know, you break it down into these tiny little chunks and you can even break each stage down to um, let's get to the halfway mark of the stage. And then before you know it, you only have a hundred kilometers left to go. And, um, you know, it is like Igley said, uh, all about perspective. Yeah, right on, right on. All right, well, I'll tell you what, guys. Uh, I know it's uh, super late. Uh, you guys have had long days, uh, and if it's four a.m. in the morning, it's even longer. But a final question: um, If there's one race relating message you'd like to leave viewers with tonight, what would it be? Mm -hmm. Great question. I guess for me, um, it's uh, just get off the couch and go do it. You know, if you have your wildest dream, and Dakar was my wildest dream at one point, um, you know, 
take one step towards that dream, you know, chop that up into the, all those little pieces and the steps to do it. Look at it on a website, take a look at the competitor section, figure out what you need to do to even think about getting there. And, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know that Dakar has to be the, your first step, but it might be one of our North American rallies. So go look at the Sonora rally or the Baja rally and sign up and go. Uh, you know, it's just that simple. Yeah, right on. And Agla? Yeah, I think just starting is, is like the big thing. Like, it doesn't matter uh, what the result is going to be. What matters is that you just do start, even if it's a smaller rally, even if it's a three, four day rally, doesn't matter. If that's what you want to do, you just got to start doing it. Because it's like with, with round the world travel, you know, if you think about, oh, I'm going to ride around the world and it might feel overwhelming. But if you just look at it, okay, I'm just going to go from Arizona to Mexico see what happens and then kind of keep doing that you will go you know right around the world eventually so yeah just starting is, is kind of huge and nothing is impossible so well, well all right guys that's that's awesome stuff well tell you what uh you know thanks to to, to you guys uh you know uh, nathan agle and alex for taking the time to uh appear tonight uh you know despite these crazy time differences um you know and sort of offering your thoughts and everything but uh you guys definitely go get some rest um and uh we will sign off here thanks thanks again guys appreciate you coming on thank you awesome thank you awesome thanks. all right well uh that was it for our grassroots adv racing show hope we got some questions and heard some really cool stories from some of the people that have taken the leap and made it happen please join us next week when we talk about adventure training uh, with a longtime friend bill dragoo uh, head of DART, which is his training company. Um, do you need training? And uh, what do we need to know about off-road riding coming from street or dirt backgrounds? In the meantime, please visit AdventureMotorcycle.com for all things ADV. Send us a note if there's a topic that you would like us to cover. Until then, ride safe and have fun. Wow.